Good morning. Sorry, we're having uh, sorry for a little bit of a delay. We are trying to get all of our panels on board. Um, but welcome. I am Michelle Nellenbach, the director of strategic initiatives here at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and thrilled that you all could join us for the third in a series of events we've had, looking at what various sectors and businesses need in order to safely resume operations. And now that we're reopening, what they need to do to maintain that. Um, when we started this series, we thought we were through the worst of the pandemic. Obviously, we're seeing spikes in a number of places in the country, and so that kind of changes the dialogue a little bit. But uh, thrilled by, to be um, joined by four great panelists. Uh, but before I get to them, I just want to point out you can you can ans ask questions through the chat through Twitter at um, at BPC underscore bipartisan. We use the hashtag. BPC Live, or you can also ask questions through YouTube. We're going to start now with um, two very distinguished guests. I am thrilled that we could be joined by Representative Henry Cuellar from Texas's 28th District and Representative Garrett Graves from Louisiana's 6th District. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you so much and good morning. Thrilled Thank to have you. you here. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to, like I alluded to a few minutes ago, obviously we, this has changed a little bit since we started this series. We're now seeing numbers spiking up. I just wanted to give you both kind of an opportunity to talk about what's going on back home. What are you seeing? Gary, go ahead. I'll follow you. Thank you. Good to see you this morning, Henry. Um, so, so look, uh, Louisiana, we certainly saw an early uh, surge it, here, I think, largely tied to Mardi Gras. Who would have thought that a, a combination of little sleep, way too much alcohol, and close proximity of people would have been a good environment to transmit a virus? But that's just what happened. And in New Orleans in particular, we saw an extraordinary early uh, spike in cases that then seeded other areas of Louisiana. Um, I think that folks began getting a bit more comfortable as the numbers uh, started going down. But in recent weeks, we have uh, largely post Memorial Day, we have seen a, an increase in cases. Now, it is important to keep in mind that, uh, like in many other states, our testing efforts have expanded considerably. Uh, but no matter how you look at it, uh, the numbers are going up. And you are certainly seeing uh, much greater concern. You've seen mandatory mask requirements in some cases. You've seen more restrictions on, on businesses and the conditions under which they're opening. And it was projected that we would be moving to phase three by now, uh, but that has also been delayed. So uh, we're certainly uh, uh, concerned about the, the direction that we're seeing right now. But at the same time, I think the community is responding in the right way by increasing their personal responsibility and sort of roles in, in protection and hygiene and other things. So um, uh, I'm, I'm certain we'll get out of this, but don't like the trend we're seeing right now. And how are you? How are things back in Texas, Representative Cuellar? 
Well, I'm actually in D.C. Uh, working on the appropriations this whole week. Uh, we'll be here for the month of July. But I left Laredo. Nice uh, weather in Laredo. Was, I think it was about 101 degree weather uh, <laughs> in uh, my hometown of Laredo. Uh, so believe it or not, it's cooler up here in D.C. But let me let me say this. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Michelle, and, and to the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center, and to my good friend, uh, uh, Garrett. Um, look, there, there are, uh, I think experts have told us that there's four things that we need to look at. One, are we doing enough testing? Two, is there a system to uh, trace the people that uh, might test positive? Three, uh, are the hospitals not working on a crisis mode? And number four, do we have two weeks of cases going down? Well, in Texas, when we, if you look at those, you know, those four items in Texas, when we started, Texas was one of those states where the numbers were very, very, very low. But we've seen in the last month where now cases are spiked, uh, have really spiked up. And, you know, you have uh, um, states like uh, Florida and Texas and a couple of other ones where, you know, we have the highest increases of cases. And I same thing as Garrett said, uh, I, I think what happened, people got a little comfortable as we started opening up. And, you know, I've always said all you have to do is just walk out with uh, with a mask. Uh, and just wear the mask. Uh, you know, if you look at 100 years ago, uh, when we had the, um, the pandemic, you know, where it killed tens of millions of people, we learned a couple of things from that time. And that is uh, wearing masks, social distancing, certain basic lessons that it still apply today. The difference between 1918 and now is that we got modern technology, new medicines, uh, and we're hoping uh, and I know in the appropriations, we literally have put billions of dollars uh, with uh, Garrett's help to make sure uh, that we develop a, a, a treatment, but a vaccine, whether it's at the end of the year or at the beginning of the year, you know, we're trying to get to those stages where we can develop a vaccine. Uh, so again, we, we need to learn uh, from what happened 100 years ago. And, and again, wearing a mask, uh, social distancing, the basic things that uh, we need to do will get us through this. And, and we are gonna get through this. It's, it's dark times, but we are gonna get through this. But remember, 100 years ago, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the innovation, they didn't have the medicines that we have, and they got through, took them years. We don't wanna go through this in years. We now, instead of looking at years, we now look at months, and we're hoping that uh, we get this uh, vaccine or treatment that will work to get us to what we need to get to. Well, I, I certainly share your optimism. Hopefully we will be, see the um, downward trend of this very soon. So I know we're here to talk about what you're hearing from your businesses, particularly as they kind of reopen and now you have this surge. But before we get to that, you know, we are the Bipartisan Policy Center. And so I'm just kind of curious, how did you two come to be working together? Is this, um, especially because we're not in, you all are not in DC very often together. So I'm just kind of curious, Republican, Democrat, how did you form a partnership around these issues? Garrett, you contacted me, and we'll take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Um, you know, Michelle, it's no secret to anybody, especially the Bipartisan Policy Center, that divisiveness and uh, the, the, the partisan uh, divisiveness in, in Congress is really extraordinary. And um, in my opinion, you have way too many people that put party first before the people that they're supposed to be representing. But there are a handful of people in Congress, and look, I wanna be clear, this is a problem on both sides of the political aisle, the political spectrum, but there are a handful of people that are willing to look at the right policy, look at what's best for the people that they represent. And unfortunately, that's a, that's a small group of people in the Congress, but without question, uh, Congressman Quaylar Henry is, is, is one of those people. He and I have worked on bipartisan legislation in the past that, that has passed the House. Um, uh, some measure of, of effectiveness in regard to that partnership and relationship. And so whenever things come up, uh, we, we uh, try and reach out to him or others who may have a, a common interest. And, and it's been a great dialogue amongst our teams on this one. And, uh, and we have legislation that we came up with, again, uh, addresses concerns of, of the folks that we represent in Louisiana, the folks that he represents in Texas, and I think a good policy decision for the nation. So I, I just, I really do appreciate the, the friendship and most importantly, uh, the courage that Congressman Quaylar has to, 
to look beyond uh, uh, party and, and just what is the right thing to do at this time. Great. So following up Thank on you. that, uh, Congressman Quayler, what are you hearing from folks back home? Why did you – well, first tell us a little bit about what the bill is that you all are talking about. What are you hearing from your businesses? Well, you know, you know, first of all, you know, what we're trying to do is trying to balance, uh, as Garrett said, we're trying to find the balance between the health of the individual and the health of the economy. So how do we take care of the health of the individual, whether it's a worker or, or a consumer or a customer uh, coming into a small business? And how do you balance that with the health of a small business uh, that has been hit pretty hard? Uh, I mean, I've talked to businesses that have just opened up and as soon as they open up, they got hit with this. Uh, and I've been a small business owner. I'm an attorney by profession, a PhD, but I've been a small business owner. I know what it is to have a payroll and deal with regulations and, and personnel. I, I, I know that. And it's hard. Uh, so imagine with this pandemic hits a small business owner and, and what that uh, what that means to that. So the small business owners and, and, and other businesses, universities, um, you know, I had a call with uh, the uh, sports teams in, in Texas, the San Antonio Spurs, the, uh, the uh, you know, the uh, Astros and other folks that were saying, hey, look, what's going to happen when we open? So while I was looking at this, uh, my good friend Garrett, who had pu been putting a lot of work on this, called me up and said, hey, why don't we work on this issue together? And it was one of those things that Garrett, you know, first of all, uh, has a very good reputation. He's a, he's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. But I think we both uh, understand that we don't come up here to represent a party. We come up here to represent uh, our district, our state, and our country. Uh, and that was the way we used to do things in the old days, where the, it was a competition between ideas. And if it was a good idea by a Republican, you work with that Republican. If it was a good idea by a Democrat, you work with that, uh, uh, that Democrat. So you work in the marketplace for ideas. And, and this is where Garrett and I got together uh, to, you know, to say, look, uh, how do we safely open up a small business, a university, a hospital, a sports team, whatever the case might be, where they are following the rules they do everything they're supposed to and not have a, a, a frivolous lawsuit uh, foul on top of them. So imagine trying to start up a business uh, again from the pandemic and here comes this lawsuit or different lawsuits. It would make it very, very, very difficult. And that's what we're trying to do. If somebody that plays by the rules, follows the rules, then they should not be penalized. If somebody intentionally uh, or is miss, uh, you know, gross negligence or something like that, uh, then that's a different thing. If it's a bad apple, that's a different thing. But there's good people that are trying to do the right thing, and that's what uh, Garrett and I are trying to do is protect those folks. Great. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm going to ask you to say a little bit more about that, Congressman Graves, about because obviously we're seeing, you hear, see the news reports of people not wearing masks in businesses, of, of not social distancing, um, but those are not the folks that we're necessarily looking to protect. Like, so when I go into my local grocery store, I'm not allowed in the door without a mask on. They are being very responsible in, in terms of making sure that people are, are adhering to all of the various guidances that are out there. Those are the kind of businesses that you're interested in, in helping. Absolutely. And as, as Congressman Quaylard noted, this there's so much uncertainty associated with coronavirus. Uh, we in our lifetime we've never been through this, and he uh, very appropriately was talking about the lessons learned we can extract from the influenza pandemic in the early 1900s, and we certainly need to take those lessons and and apply them as best we can here. But but this is a new virus. These are th this is a curveball a day that we're seeing, and. With all of the challenges that have been thrust upon our small businesses across the United States, having the uncertainty or the additional challenge of having lawsuits and folks um, of, uh, suing them because they found out six months from now that if that, that hand sanitizer was actually not uh, uh, protecting folks from from getting the virus, we certainly can't cripple our businesses, bankrupt our businesses, and, and create that degree of uncertainty. So, so as Congressman Quaylor said, we, we got together and to tr try and provide better certainty in these areas where we can for our small businesses, trying to help uh, uh, them have a better future and, and, and better economic sustainability, just said that as long as they are complying 
with the health guidelines by the CDC or their local health department, including the mask and safe hygiene and distancing and others, then they certainly can't be held liable for information or for um, uh, medical liabilities that were not known at the time. So as long as folks are following the best practices, that, um, that, that they would be protected from that additional uncertainty of lawsuits that in these financially precarious times would sink a lot of the businesses, the small businesses that are out there, which are really the driver of the economy and employment. So I want to, I'm going to hit one more question and then turn it over to the, the chat for, um, for audience questions. You know, sort of liability reform, tort reform has a very long, tortured partisan history. Um, I think it's a little unfortunate that we are seeing some partisanship grow around the response. Uh, how are we going to get this across the finish? I mean, obviously, there's going to be a big deal that will probably be ma ironed out between Speaker Pelosi and Leader McConnell. How do you get your bill into that conversation? Well, I'll go ahead and say this. I, I mean, look, a lot of times Democrats, uh, and quite honestly, they, they don't support uh, this type of, um, uh, of uh, legislation, but there are Democrats, uh, blue dogs uh, like myself, that do support this. I, I, you know, in the state legislature, I supported uh, tort reform. You know, I don't want it to go so much uh, against business or so much against a worker. It's trying to find a balance. And here, all we're trying to do is just find a balance. I mean, think about this. You will give limited liability protection to a small business, uh, a, a university or a school uh, that uh, is following the CDC uh, practices, you know, local practices, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, and if there's no gross negligence or indifference, why are we going to penalize them through a lawsuit? It, it's common sense. And, and I understand, uh, you know, uh, keep this in mind, but I'll give you a little secret. Uh, when we had the, um, the Health Care Affordability Act that we passed back in 2010, I actually added a tort reform piece of legislation there that a lot of people didn't know. And I worked this out with, uh, with Pelosi. It was basically there will be no new causes of action under this you know, particular piece of legislation. So actually, I have passed a little bit of uh, legislation uh, de dealing with tort reform. So I, I think what Gary and I are going to do is when this um, HEROES Act or whatever you want to call it, the new stimulus, uh, uh, this is what we need to come in and try to find a balance. I, uh, I think Gary can talk about the Republican side, but we're hoping we can do this. And Gary, you want to talk about how CARES 1 has some provisions there also? Uh, you know, there's already there's already um, uh, there's already some provisions that talks about this in CARES Act one. Go ahead, Gary. Great, great point. Yep. Oh. All right. Yep. Sorry about that. Hit the wrong button. Uh, That's okay. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so look, it's it's important to keep in mind that um, Senator McConnell has has talked about liability protection being an important component of this next piece of legislation. Um, we are up against the backstop in that the, the unemployment assistance does expire at the end of this month. The uh, Paycheck Protection Program is beginning to run out of funding. We now have been through this for a number of months and need to be charting that next course of economic recovery in addition to uh, providing assistance directly to those most impacted, whether it be a second stimulus, uh, a, a second phase of a PPP program or other uh, programs. So, there is legislation that's moving forward. Um, this is something that has been identified uh, by many of our small businesses, those that are trying to stay afloat, trying to continue offering employment opportunities to individuals and working families. And so um, the, the perspective that, that Henry and I had here was that if this is going to be something that, that folks are demanding or pushing to include in this legislation, let's be proactive. Let's come up with a bipartisan solution. And I will tell you, um, Henry provided us very good feedback and perspective based on his experience. He pulled us back into, on some provisions and into some areas that made much more sense and better common ground, providing that perspective of, um, of the Democrat caucus in some cases. And so I think that we have a good product. If folks are out there saying this needs to be part of this next phase, let's not let this become a big partisan fight. Let's be proactive. Let's have a, a bipartisan proposal that can make it in this bill. Uh, so we both have been talking to our colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats, about what this bill does and trying to build uh, support and awareness for it. And I'm, I'm confident that we can we can build on some of the liability protections now and, and provide better certainty for these businesses moving forward. 
Great. Well, thank you both. And certainly um, the reason BPC embarked on these series of events is we do think there is a middle ground. Your bill seems to be a really great starting point for those conversations and, and a reasonable middle ground where you can bring both sides together, where it's not just universal, everyone's exempt from liability, but it's really targeted those who've tried very hard to abide by all of the various guidances and do the right thing going forward. Um, one question we got from the uh, chat is how can businesses prepare properly for other surges in the fall? Because I think we're hearing that we're surging now. This probably isn't the last time that's going to happen. So how can businesses prepare for that? Do you guys have some thoughts for them? Well, I'll, I'll just say a, a couple of just general observations. I mean, I mean, first of all, let's go with lessons learned. I mean, what, what's work, uh, you know, the mask, the hand sanitizers, just the um, social distancing. Uh, let's go ahead and just follow those basic rules. Uh, I, I know that, you know, businesses now, you know, including ourselves, we're doing telework and and uh, putting the, 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 the um, uh, shields, you know, when there's contact with individuals. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're trying to take all the necessary steps and I think businesses need to understand that. Uh, I, I um, you know, that, that's one what they need to do. What we do in Congress, I think July is gonna be a very important month, uh, as Garrett said, because, mm -hmm. you know, the, we, we need to put uh, more uh, resources out there. Uh, and as we do that, uh, this is what we look at this uh, provision that uh, Garrett and I are working on. But I, I have to say this is that, look, you know, we are spending billions of dollars on, on research and trying to find uh, a vaccine on that. Uh, I, I sound optimistic because I think, you know, hopefully, if not by the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, we should have something. We have the brightest minds, uh, not only in the U.S., uh, not only on the civilian, but in the military working on this. And, and I, I, I just trust, uh, you know, what we can do as Americans to find a solution to this. Uh, and besides what we're doing, there are so many other countries that are trying to find the same thing. I, I feel very confident that we will come up with a solution uh, that is a vaccine, uh, whether it's at the end of the year, or at the beginning of the year. Uh, but in the meanwhile, let's just follow the lessons we learned 100 years ago and do that. And then Congress will do its work up here on whatever funding that we can find consensus on. Great. Well, it is it is really um, heartening to know that there are folks like both of you up there trying to find uh, bipartisan solutions to, to the crisis. And I thank you so much for being here. We've, we've held you a little longer than we had planned. So I want to thank you both. And, you know, as you work on other bills together, feel free to reach out. We're always looking to give bipartisan partners a forum to talk about their work together and thank you both very much stay safe and healthy thank you thank you garrett and thank you michelle hey thank you all very much appreciate it good to see you all again bye-bye thanks all right and we're going to now move into our second panel and again if you want to do questions you can do so on twitter at, at bpc underscore bipartisan just use the hashtag bpc live and if you're watching on YouTube, there is also a way to do questions there. Uh, and with that, I want to bring in our second panel. Um, we are joined by Julie Joukowsky, the Senior VP for Corporate General Counsel, Corporate General Counsel and Secretary for Casey's General Store, and Laura Robertson, who is the Deputy General Counsel of Conical Phillips. Um, I should have said this at the outset, but because um, we're short on time, I'm not going through everyone's bio, but viewers, if you want more information on any of the force panelists, just go to the BPC website and you can learn more about all of them there. Um, ladies, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to just jump right in here with you, Julie. So let's start off with an overview of Casey's. You have locations in 16 states, uh, but viewers in some parts of the country likely aren't familiar with Casey, so tell us about the company, your employees, and your geographic scope. And um, one interesting thing about Casey's is that we are um, the fifth largest pizza retailer in the country as far as uh, location. So we made we do all of our own uh, made from scratch pizza, which comes into the whole COVID crisis of when we're in rural communities, which more than 50% of our stores are in towns of less than 5,000 people, where the gas station, the general store, the, the restaurant. Um, so we hit all of those parameters. So, you know, I come from a larger chain. Um, I'm also the chair of the National Association of Convenience Stores. So we also really are looking at um, 
just like the, the congressman uh, noted, small businesses, because most convenience stores are small businesses. So looking at this not only from a large operator standpoint, but also from that small, uh, small business standpoint as well. And uh, was Casey's deemed an essential business in all of the states you operate? Um, absolutely, we were, and, and um, you know, we really appreciated the advocacy efforts that we uh, that, that were ongoing at the beginning of this crisis. You know, being an essential business is it, it, it's been um, you know great to be able to keep the doors open, but as you all can imagine, during the COVID crisis from the beginning. It was very difficult. Um, you know, we all do disaster planning and, and all of that, but it's more in the Midwest if a tornado hits the distribution center, how are we going to get products to the stores in two weeks as opposed to, you know, a global pandemic that goes on for months. Um, and so, you know, things have just really been changing. That essential business has been critical, especially in those small, smaller rural communities, although we're in, also in metropolitan areas, but to get that fuel there, to make sure that supply chain is working. Um, and as we know, there, there were instances with supply chain issues. Just think about toilet paper, right? So, um, you know, <laughs> and, and, and restaurants and food. So it's been really an interesting process to work through just to see how agile we can become to make those changes as the different regulations uh, and guidelines change. So let's talk about that a little bit. So with locations in 16 states, um, how did you manage the different guidances from the different states? Because they, uh, everyone sort of put out their own information at various stages. That's got to be really hard for a company that spans several states. So <laughs> talk to us about how you managed all that. Well, it was interesting at the beginning. We put together in early March before, you know, really things broke out wide across the country, put together a task force that was really going through scenario planning. That task force has about 10 people. Um, different folks come in and out, but they come from um, all different departments. And the goal there was to put people in a room that could make quick decisions, um, look at the, the CDC guidance. At the, initially, it was the CDC guidance um, you know, that we looked at primarily. But then as you went into the different 16 state areas, all the states operated differently, whether it was you can't have self-service pop or you can't have um, you know, self-server, you have to have only five people in your location at a time. The difficulty, you know, was then uh, exacerbated when some of the local officials would then interpret those regulations differently. So we really had to have all hands on deck to make sure that we're talking with local health officials, with the state officials, and, and with uh, federal agencies to make sure that we're doing the best we can to protect not only our team members, but our guests. Great. So I want to bring Laura in here. So as we just heard from Julie, you know, gas stations, the convenience stores remained open in the past few months, even though most Americans weren't driving anywhere. Um, but the energy needs didn't go away. We still needed electricity for millions of people, particularly more because people weren't leaving their homes. Um, but I don't think energy producers were top of mind when many, many people were thinking about the impacts this was having on essential businesses. Um, since they're not really customer facing in many cases. So what aspects of ConocoPhillips operations stayed open? Uh, how many in individuals are employed in those areas that stayed open? Oh, hold on one second, Julie, we're, I think you're, or Laura, you're mute. Okay, now. Am I on, can you hear me? Yep, all good, yep, go ahead. So thank you, Michelle, really appreciate uh, you inviting me here today. So as you mentioned, yes, uh, ConocoPhillips uh, was deemed an essential business. And as you may know, we are one of the largest uh, E&P energy companies in the world. So we employ over 10,000 people worldwide. We operate in 17 countries. And that's where we, you know, we explore for and produce energy that is essential for the world. And we were fortunately able to continue our operations through uh, this pandemic without interruption. And I, and I think it's uh, important to highlight how my company approached this. You know, these are unprecedented times, as we all know, and we had three top priorities and first and foremost the number one priority was protecting the workforce protecting health and safety 
We were also focused on mitigating the spread of the virus. And then with those priorities in mind, having the goal of being able to continue to run our business safely. So your company has a very large, you just mentioned 17 countries. That's a pretty significant geographic footprint across multiple jurisdictions. Um, how did you manage a crisis that's not just at the company level, but it's a, it really spans the globe? And uh, as Julie had alluded, the you know, states and local governments had different guidance, but I've got to believe different countries had different guidance for how you all were to proceed. So the way we approached it is we followed, FEMA has an incident um, <clears throat> plan that we followed. So we had really a two-step approach from the corporate corporate, which is based in Houston, we had a CMST, a crisis management support team that really served as an, an umbrella to coordinate um, the, the global response. And then we had a site specific approach. So each of our business units and operations would, had their own local business unit support team, crisis team, and so it was a coordinated approach bet both between the corporate, at the corporate level, as well as at the local level. And that was how we were able to incorporate the, take into account guidelines that we were receiving at the federal level, as well as locally, whether, you know, like here in the US with each state or local government guidelines, you know, again, ultimately with a goal of being able to provide energy to the world, which is essential, but with our number one priority of protecting our workforce. And how was, what was the communication and outreach efforts between um, the company and the employees? Because you obviously don't have um, the customers walking in the front door, but as you said, you've got uh, 10,000 people that you had to keep safe while they continued to do their job. So what was that, that communication system? You know, I always think about from day one, our CEO, Ryan Lance, he said at the very first communication I heard that communication is key early and often. And I can attest that I have never, I've been at the company for over 13 years and I've never seen so much communication directly from our CEO. He's emailed regularly, had videos to the workforce, and then you know, of course, that trickles down for the leadership to be communicating directly with the workforce. You know, I meet with my team at first. It was every day and now it's once a week just to check in on them, listen to their issues, making sure we're addressing those issues. And then the, the crisis management support team has done an excellent job. From day one, they created a, a resource site, you know, FAQ site where, and it was, you know, populated and regularly updated. So as questions would come in throughout the company that would trickle up and then make it to that resource site. And my understanding is thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hits have gone to the site. So that you had, you had mentioned lessons learned. That's a really, really important advice to companies, you know, reopening or opening to, constantly communicate and then have those resources available, you know, regularly. Great. Um, so, uh, Julie, so I assume that uh, Casey had similar outreach to your, because you've got stores, so many stores in different states. And how is that, how did you maintain communication with, with um, the local businesses? Sure, we, we've done that similarly. So we, you know, through this task force, um, Initially, we the task force meets daily. Um, they were, we were meeting three times a week with um, upper management as well to go through all of the different scenarios. Um, also looking at um, whether there were any cases and, and things that we needed to do with regard to mitigation measures. But the communication has, has been um, enhanced more than it was before, not only resource centers, but um, videos from the CEO. Um, you know, and as we've had to pivot on a moment, moment's notice as these guidelines change, I think those resource centers have been critical uh, because we have to be very, you know, you have to bullet point 
the, the key information because our, our stores and our managers are getting so much information, um, you know, and they're trying to sort through what they're getting, not only from us, but what they're seeing on TV, um, you know, and so trying to make sure that they're understanding what are our company's uh, responsibilities, not only to team members and the public, but what are our expectations to make sure that we comply. And, um, and, and the need to comply with the regulations that we put out. So it's, it's been an interesting uh, scenario. I think we're all gonna learn a lot, not only from the COVID pandemic and in, in, in health, but just on how we communicate with our workforce uh, to make things happen quickly and efficiently. So, cause I think that uh, stores like Casey's are, were kind of front and center in so much of this. I think people still felt comfortable throwing on a mask on and going to their local convenience store. Um, and so what does social, because those are not a huge store, what does social distancing look right. like at a Casey's? Um, you know, there's obviously parts of the experience that can't be made touchless. So how did you all handle all that? You know, it's, and, and initially, you know, as we all think back to March, it seems like a, an eternity ago, doesn't it? Thinking back to March, but, yes. you know, we weren't supposed to wear masks and then we were supposed to wear masks and, you know, things like that of, of just trying to figure out, all right, how can we best social distance? So we did what you'll see in a lot of places now with, you know, the stickers on the floors and making, you know, traffic go one way. Um, because we're, we, we sell food and we're also the restaurant and it's a convenience store, so most of it's self-serve. You know, that was interesting of switching from self-serve model to serving people because people aren't used to going into a, a convenience store and having um, one of our team members serve them. So that's been um, kind of interesting as well, but trying to get you know the plexiglass shields, um, enhancing all of the, um, the hygiene and sanitation requirements in the store, how often and frequently we clean, cleaning the pumps. Um, you think of how often you go to a, a, a gas station and you're touching so many things at the pump. So enhancing cleaning uh, there as well, just trying to get that supply. Um, it's very difficult, you know, it took six to eight weeks just to get enough masks for all of our team members. Um, you know, luckily those are in, in supply now, but been really interesting and, and um, you know, trying to get those protocols in place. You know, we also had to do other things, and I shouldn't say have to do other things. We took other measures, understanding that it was, you know, it is a crisis and we are asking people to work in an essential business and, you know, enhancing their pay during that time period for appreciation pay for putting themselves in that situation and, and working with us to protect themselves and the public. Oh, that, that's great to hear. Um, Cause you're right. They, they really were on the front lines of so much of this. Um, so you just, you both just heard the, the previous panel, the members of Congress talk about uh, concern around potential liability and um, how much of a concern is that for your companies? Take us through the different dimensions you're thinking about in terms of liability and reopening. Well, I, I, I think know, for John, ours, uh, go ahead. Yep. Okay. Sorry. You know, for ours, I, th I think, you know, liability protection is key, you know, and, I, and um, you know, I, I think as the, as the congressman correctly stated, you know, we're not pushing for some type of legislation that, that protects the person or the company that didn't take any action or didn't do the best job that they could do based on the guidelines that were presented to them at the time. Um, it, it's being a good corporate citizen. You know, our, our motto at Casey's is here for good, and that's not only the here for in the community to serve, but here to do the right thing. And, and so that's what we've tried our, our best to do. So working through that liability protection, um, you know, using our resources to serve our communities, to um, pay our employees properly. Um, as you know, with litigation, um, regardless of, of whether you prevail or not, it's a lot of time, resources, um, money, and outlay of, of personal time from, from our staff. So. Um, really looking at those liability protections in a bipartisan way to protect those businesses that did the best that they could under the circumstances, uh, considering the fact that at the onset, the regulations were changing daily. Laura, what's, how's ConocoPhillips viewing all this? So, so ConocoPhillips supports liability protection, um, you know, as said before, as long as companies act in good faith and take uh, reasonable steps to protect uh, the workforce and the community, then they deserve, you know, we think they should get the protections, liability protections, not have to, you know, face the risk of frivolous yet expensive litigation. And, you know, similarly, we, you know, ConocoPhillips took the same types of 
steps with that with that first priority and second priority of protecting our workforce and mitigating the spread, we have followed both federal CDC guidelines as well as local guidelines and um, and in some cases exceeded it with that good faith, reasonable effort to try to protect our workforce um, and to the extent we um, interact with the public. You know, that, that involves, you know, the regular standards with the requiring face mask, the temperature checks, plexiglass, um, enhanced uh, sanitation. I mean, I can say uh, our office, um, corporate office is open, but it's on a voluntary basis. And so all of those steps have been taken and it feels very safe there. And so I think as long as companies take those reasonable steps, um, then they should get this liability protection. You know, this is particularly um, just from a policy perspective, I think this really focuses on or can really hit small businesses, you know, businesses that are on the margin. And there is a balance. We're giving them clarity and comfort, clarity on what are considered reasonable steps, you know, the CDC guidelines and any additional local um, guidelines that come out that if they take those steps and they invest in those steps, as it's also an incentive to do so, then they will not face um, frivolous litigation. Of course, it's not trying to protect, as said, you know, businesses, any businesses that are bad actors or do, you know, willful um, misconduct, you know, you know, really don't care. You know, it's the companies that want to reopen. It's a balance between um, the health, which is obviously first and foremost, but also the need to get the economy up and running. And so giving those businesses, you know, that security that if they take the right steps and they act in good faith, then they don't have to face, which can be expensive um, and lengthy litigation. Great, thank you both. So, um, you know, the members are kind of looking at, and you both have mentioned this, the, the good faith effort where you've got, and I think it's particularly interesting for the two of your companies because you you cross so many different jurisdictions and there's so many different guidance documents and, and such that you've had to abide by. Um, if you've got good faith, if, so if the protection applies to those who have made a good faith effort to comply with all those various regulations, does that type of proposal, proposal give you confidence going forward? If you've done your best to comply with all that, it, you're you're protected. It it does me. I, I mean, I, you know, obviously there's going to be some warts on that as far as what is good faith compliance, um, it, you know, and in 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 the like. But, um, you know, I, I think with with things we've both been talking about, masks, social distancing, um, taking what in our stores it would be, you know, plexiglass or mitigating measures and you know that sort of thing everybody's going to be a little bit different depending upon their environment, but really making sure that you're looking at all aspects of your business to show that you are in good faith compliance. Um, you know, I, I think it's nice that we're talking about it and that we, um, you know, as, as the congressman has said, it, looking at this in a bipartisan way to, to it, it's not to, to get out of trouble or not to have to pay. It's so that we can focus on making sure that we can, uh, continue with those safety measures going forward and do the best we can to serve the public, um, especially since we are essential businesses. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, I think oh, go ahead. Yep. The, oh yeah, I was going to say the, the important part is how, how do you define good faith? And, I, and I've been following the draft and, you know, I think the CDC guidelines, which is, you know, as I understand it, is the current focus as well as if you're, you know, in a, in a in a particular jurisdiction that has specific guidelines, you know, giving businesses that clarity on if they take those basic steps, as we've talked about, masks, sanitation, <laughs> and, and the like, then they get that protection. And I and I do feel like we would feel a lot more comfortable um, to have that protection, that layer of protection, so that we're not worried about facing, you know, frivolous litigation. You know, there's a there's a risk that you get, you know businesses settle those claims, it could be settled for nuisance value or litigation value, but then that it spurs more litigation, even though 
against companies who have done, you know, who've acted reasonably and in good faith and following the same protocols that everybody else is following. That is what we're, that's what we're talking about here. Okay. Um, so I want to ask, I'm going to turn to audience questions in just a second, but I wanted to follow up on one thing. So, you know, obviously certain parts of the country are surging now. I know um, that Laura, you're in Houston and they're clearly experiencing an upsurge in cases. Do you feel like, so if we've got another surge in the fall or we continue through this one, do you think you, are you all are well prepared for that? Do you think you've learned enough lessons in order to be able to, to, to get through that? I won't say easily because none of this is easy these days. So I think that um, it's best laid plans. So we had, um, you know, a crisis management plan um, that had been tested, you know, it had been tested for not for a pandemic, so to speak, but it was and it's and it worked really well and it's um, been very organized. So um, being prepared is important, but going forward, well, and honestly, we've already learned this, it's really important, I think, to be both flexible as well as, I would say, um, compassionate. It's important to, you know, listen to what's going on, watch what's going on, keep, you know, keep close contact with the federal and local governments and what they're seeing and, and the guidance they're giving and listening to the workforce to ensure that we are meeting all of our priorities, which is obviously first the health and safety of our workforce and mitigating the spread, but um, you know, making sure that we can keep providing you know, essential businesses, essential needs, um, in, in our case, energy. And so, Flexibility and compassion uh, is what I'd say going forward on top of the um, extensive preparedness that was already in place. Great. Julie, did you want to get in there? Sure, sure. You know, I, I think it's it's not letting our guard down. Um, you know, out in the Midwest, you know, we all look at these maps that are out on, you know, on, on TV all the time as to where um, the hot spots are. and. Who would have known that Iowa, you know, became a little bit of a hot spot? I think we're on quarantine. If I go visit some of you, I'll you'll be on quarantine. Who knew? But um, you know, we're out where, at least initially, there weren't a lot of cases. So um, you know, it, and when that happens, people let their their guard down a little bit. You know, in some of these rural areas, trying to encourage people, they say, well, we've only had you know one case in a five county area. Well, you still need to wear your masks, and so that's been, you know, a little bit of a struggle. Even with, um, you know, we have mandatory mask requirements in our stores, but even in those areas where, if they haven't had any cases, they don't really, it, it doesn't always register. So trying to be diligent and and make sure that we that we follow up on on what our protocols are. Another thing that we have done in our stores is we implemented a, 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 an A and a B team, um, meaning we don't, you know, in a convenience store environment or in retail or fast food. A lot of people work different shifts. We have those teams work together in the A team or the B team. So in case we do have uh, someone who tests positive, uh, when we go back through contact tracing, they haven't uh, essentially exposed uh, the whole staff because that's a problem as well. You can't run the store uh, without a staff. So making sure that we stay diligent going forward. Um, we anticipate, you know, we anticipated a spike um, based on the information we were receiving, thinking it was going to come probably in October or November. And um, I don't think we've gotten out of the first phase and we're seeing it spike again. So, you know, all, all um, indications are that this is going to go on for several months and most of us aren't going to be back in the corporate headquarters working and the stores are going to continue on limited operations or on those limited staffing teams. And I think that's just how we're going to have to operate um, across all businesses to maintain the safety of team members and guests. So I wanted to follow up a little bit on that one, Julie, because one of the questions we got from the audience was, how do you ensure your customers are complying with all the various regulations and requirements? Right. And so in many cases, that's putting your workforce, who's not really, they're not there for, they're not an enforcement body, if you will, to, to question customers and ask them to put their masks on. How, how has that been? I mean, do you, do they feel that they are empowered enough to do that? And how much of an issue are you getting from your customers? 
Yeah, thank goodness, you know, we've seen some incidents, you know, on, on the news of, of some really unfortunate situations when uh, team members are just trying to do their job and, and um, you know, mm -hmm. ask somebody to wear a mask. We really have not had any, um, you know, any awful situations. We, you have people who argue with you and say, that's not necessary and that's my right. I don't have to wear a mask. We don't have mandatory mask requirements of guests in, um, in all of our stores. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the area and the state. Um, like I was talking about some of those areas where, um, where there have been very few cases, uh, there isn't going to be a mandatory mask requirement of guests. But we see that when we, when we implemented and were able to get those masks out on all of our uh, team members, I think it's when the team members wear the masks, the guests wear the masks more because they really, they see that example. Um, it was interesting though, like you pointed out at the beginning when we had some of the local, um, the, the local governments, it was more on how many people in a store. So that was really tricky. They said, well, you have to make sure there's no more than eight people in a store. Well, does that include your staff members? Does that just mean guests? You know, where are they? We're the local gathering place um, in some of these communities. So saying, hey, you got to take your conversation out to the curb. Um, so I, I think because we know a lot of our guests really well, we're able to have those conversations. Um, but you're right, it, it is ongoing and, and our folks, they're, they're not really hired to be the enforcement agency, but that's really kind of what they've become. So, Laura, real, another question we got from the chat. Uh, what tactic or protocol worked best to ensure the health and safety of the businesses and customers? Is there one thing that really just stood out for you that this is this was the most effective thing in making sure our employees were, were safe and protected? You know, I would reiterate the importance of masks. Absolutely. Um, mask and social distancing. Social distancing, I would say, was our greatest challenge because especially when you're working in the, the field, you know, in oil and gas operations. And so a lot of work went into um, knowledge sharing across our, our operations throughout the world in um, scaling back as much as possible non-essential employees. And so, so absolutely want to reiterate that don't let your guard down, keep wearing your masks, um, and then in our business, we were really focusing on that social distancing, reducing non-essential staff, re reducing non-essential activities. And then like we even had to do, um, so, so we have some operations in colder climates. And so that's, those are areas where there were even more challenges, especially with social distancing, um, like in the North slope of Alaska and, and we have offshore platforms in Norway and that's where. We did additional protocols. Um, we had uh, quarantining, so self-quarantining for two weeks before you went on site, limited numbers of people who could fly. Now, those are areas, remote areas, where they would either fly by plane or by helicopter, limiting the people who could get on those airplanes and helicopters. So these are the challenges we dealt with every day. So I would say, number one, making sure we don't let our guard down and keep wearing our mask. And being vigilant about continuing that social distancing and being thoughtful and con constantly sharing knowledge on how to ensure we can keep that social distancing, especially in more difficult uh, locations. That, that's really helpful to hear, particularly about the mask, because unfortunately it has become somehow a political issue. And so it's always nice to have that reinforced. Um, Julie, can you talk a little bit about how you all have had to change your business operations? Sure. I, I think something else that, you know, and I think a lot of businesses have done the same as we have, we've just accelerated our digital platform or our digital offerings. We've changed how, we, how we've how we done business. So, um, you know, most convenience store transactions, I think we like to say they take three minutes and 30 seconds. People are in and out, um, which is a, you know, pretty short period of time. But there's there are people who don't want to come in, and we have had to figure out different methods uh, to get our products to them. So while we were all, you know, actually we were in a test with with DoorDash. Um, we we had our own delivery, but to en to enhance our delivery, we were in a test with DoorDash um, in 30 stores. We rolled that out to 800 stores within a couple of week period. We've um, enhanced groceries where you can order groceries online. Um, we'll have curbside pickup rolled out here in the next week or so. Um, but just trying to find different ways to provide those services to our guests in an environment where you wouldn't typically provide them in that manner. And um, you know, I, I think we're going to see that going forward. Um, 
you know, even things like kiosks, you know, that was kind of the big thing. Everybody was testing the self-service kiosks. Well, people don't want to touch the self-service kiosks right now. So, you know, just being able to pivot and figuring out even in a large operation that we really can pivot and we can be more agile if we get out of the way of the people who really know what they're doing. I think sometimes some of us in management take a little too long and we need to get out of their way. We've done it, um, been successful in that. And I think it's also listening to our guests. What is it that they really want so that we can best service them and provide them what they need? So, um, you know, it, it's just been an interesting last four or five months to see how much has been accomplished, not only by, by our business, but by so many other businesses to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, it'll be interesting to see how many of these changes stick because I think a lot of businesses have really um, developed some efficiencies they didn't know they could do before. So, I mean, there's an upside right. to all of this. If you know that, it'll be interesting to see what what holds. Um, well, I want to I want to thank both Julie and Laura for for sharing your morning with us and sharing your <laughs> company's experience. Thank you both. Um, uh, hopefully everyone stays healthy and safe going forward. And again, if you want to learn more about Julie, Laura, or the two members of Congress, please check out our website and you can follow future activities related to COVID and all kinds of different policy areas at our website at bipartisanpolicy.org. And thank you all very much for joining us. Julie and Laura, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you, Michelle. Appreciate it.